Hello everyone, I'm back for more history tonight and this time we're going to explore the biographies and significance of two very famous spies, Mata Hari and Richard Zorge. I initially intended to include more spies into this video maybe four or five, but I ended up having a lot to say about these two. So if you like the format, I will make more videos of the same kind and tell you about more spies. Our two characters for tonight will give us a good occasion to explore the times when they were active and why and how they became remarkable and famous. Their stories will take us to multiple places, like Indonesia, Paris and the world of courtesans during the Belle Epoque, the First World War, post-war Germany, and then the strategic game between Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union and Japan before and during the Second World War. But before we begin our journey through time and intrigues, you need to get ready for it. So sit down or lay down comfortably Focus on your breathing for a little while and know that in the first comment under the video you will find a couple timestamps if you wish to directly go to a particular section of this story. If you wish to download this video or others to watch offline or just the audio this is now possible from my Patreon page, the link is in the description. And now, let's start our journey through time. Our first story takes us to the beginning of the 20th century and the First World War, to the discovery of probably the most famous female spy ever, Mata Hari. On the morning of October 1917, as the First World War was raging and devastating Europe, a woman called Margaret MacLeod was brought in front of a firing squad near Paris and executed by the French army for her supposed work as a spy for Germany. A woman died that day, but a legend was born, and this is what we are going to explore now. So who was Mata Hari? She became famous years before the First World War, not as a spy, but as an exotic dancer and courtesan in Paris. And that was a very unlikely destiny that nobody could have anticipated for her. She was Dutch and born in 1876 in the Netherlands inside a relatively well-off family. She had a rather lavish childhood and received a good education until she was 13 because when she was 13 her father went bankrupt and in the following years her family fell apart at the beginning of the 1890s. Her mother died and she was sent to live with her godfather. At the time she studied to become a kindergarten teacher but she escaped a few months later to the city of The Hague apparently rejecting the kind of conventional and provincial life. 
she seemed destined to. At eighteen, she answered an advertisement placed by a Dutch captain from the colonial army. The man lived in the Dutch East Indies, which are Indonesia nowadays, and was looking for a wife. He was wealthy, and she was no longer, but she had enough education, and she was also twenty years younger than him. She had good looks, so she was an acceptable match for him. They got married, and this made her move into the Dutch upper class. Two years later, they had a first child, and the entire family moved to the Dutch East Indies, to the island of Java, and a second child followed. But the marriage quickly turned out to be a disappointment to her. Her husband was an alcoholic. He bet her and openly maintained a mistress, which would have been impossible in the relatively strict Dutch society in the Netherlands, but was socially acceptable in the colonies. Instead of accepting submission, she abandoned him and moved in with another officer, and she also used her spare time to study Indonesian traditions. This included joining a dance company, in which she took an artistic name, Mata Hari. This means eye of the day or sun in the local Malay language. They lost a child in 1899 and in 1902. After five years in the East Indies, the couple returned to the Netherlands and officially separated the divorced. Matahari had the custody of her surviving daughter, but her ex-husband never paid support as he was supposed to, and she fell back into poverty. The ex-husband did not return her daughter after a visit, and Matahari accepted this situation, either because she didn't have the resources to fight, or because she preferred to be on her own. In 1903, she moved to Paris, and started to use her dance abilities learned in Indonesia to support herself. Her first two years in France were difficult. She had to do different jobs to earn a living, including posing as an artist's model. But she started to win fame bit by bit as a so-called exotic dancer. Back then, orientalism and exotism in general were very popular in entertainment and show business. And on top of that, Southeast Asia was very popular, very trendy at the beginning of the 20th century. The audience had got used and a little bored of other regions like Middle East, India or China, or more precisely, the fantasy versions of them that was presented in plays, ballet, or operas. And things from regions like Indochina, Malaya, or Indonesia looked fresher and more intriguing to the Parisian audience. Matahari branded herself as having been initiated to centuries-old Javanese traditions and art which was a bit of a stretch, but she knew enough and she had enough sex appeal to create illusion and sell her act. Her performances were a bit flirtatious, she showed a lot of body and uh, she walked a thin line between culture, art 
and uh, eroticism expertly enough to be socially acceptable. She was particularly acclaimed for a segment of her act when she stripped off all of her clothing until she wore just a breastplate covered in jewels and a few ornaments here and there on her arms and her head. This style of entertainment already had a, a well-established tradition in Paris, dating from the 19th century. There were clubs and venues like the Moulin Rouge or the Folie Bergère, where musicals and live shows were very popular, and they included a degree of nudity or teasing of the audience. These acts exported well, actually. For example, at the beginning of the 20th century, started the Ziegfeld Follies on Broadway in New York City. And initially, these Ziegfeld Follies were directly inspired by these Parisian shows, especially the shows from the Folie Bergère. Mata Hari made a name for herself and now earned a living as an exotic dancer, but that was not her main source of income. In Paris, until the beginning of the First World War, young and ambitious actresses or dancers were also, more often than not, high-end escorts or prostitutes. They were called courtesans to avoid the crudeness of the word prostitute, but very often their profession was just a facade or an entry point into a totally different type of activity that was way more lucrative. We are not talking about regular prostitutes here who would get paid after sex. They were more like professional mistresses that upper-class men could entertain for a while and compensate with gifts, extremely expensive gifts sometimes. High-end prostitution existed long before the 19th century, but it became much more visible and socially accepted from the 1850s under the French Second Empire. It survived the fall of uh, the empire, and it flourished again after a republic was installed. Over a period of about 60 years, young women rose to fame as courtesans, generally being uh, actresses, but everybody knew what their real activity was, and they used their official profession essentially as advertisement because this profile made them more desirable to their client base. Some of them built real fortunes. They would buy or rent a mansion where they could receive their lovers. And uh, the lovers included men from the European aristocracy, sometimes kings, the king of Belgium or the future Edward VII spent a lot of time in Paris, enjoying the uh, entertainment the city could provide, including in the bedroom. There were also bankers, wealthy industrialists, diplomats, and this was barely hidden. There is a novel by Emile Zola called Nana, published 25 years before the rise of Matahari, but it describes very well, through the rise and fall of a courtesan, the atmosphere of the time. In real life, famous courtesans included women like La Paiva. La Paiva was originally from Russia, where she was born in misery and she got her name from her wedding to a Portuguese aristocrat. There were also Emilienne d'Alençon, Valtès de la Bigne, Caroline Otero, 
or Liane de Pougy. These names could make you think that these women belonged to the aristocracy, but they didn't, never. These are the artistic names that they adopted. They were all born from poor or at best middle class families and they had moved to Paris trying to escape an unhappy marriage or a life in poverty. What they had in common was their ambition, good looks and a lot of discipline. They were business women perfectly able to understand how they could be desirable to their very wealthy patrons. They could make conversation, they could dress lavishly and tease their audience enough to appear like trophies. They would turn down men regularly, sometimes for a little while. They could grant exclusivity to a particularly generous man, but not too long to avoid being demonetized. And in return for their charms, they could receive extraordinarily expensive gifts, properties, jewels, portfolios of bonds, works of art. All the ones I mentioned lasted because they managed their career, selling some of the uh, gifts they received to reinvest in their future and to fund their expenses because being a high-end courtesan required a luxury mansion, personnel, outfits. They could never be seen twice wearing the same thing and a fierce discipline. They were out to social events every night. They appeared in their car every afternoon in the wealthy neighborhoods of Paris or in parks occasionally granting a bit of their time to one of their suitors and they needed to look perfect at all times. By the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th, the most successful courtesans became celebrities well beyond the frontiers of France. With the development of photography, they edited postcards or appeared in magazines and even became touristical assets for Paris. People who had uh, no mean nor hope to uh, even talk to them would try to just see them at the opera, at a theater or walking in a park. In the years 1900s, when Matahari became famous in Paris, there were two courtesans with a particularly high profile, Caroline Otero and Liane de Pougy. Caroline Otero was originally Spanish. She told she was from a gypsy family from Andalusia. In fact, she was born in complete misery in another region of Spain and she had become a prostitute in her teens but she managed to rise above a life of abuse because she was a gifted dancer and uh, extraordinarily appealing. She moved to Marseille in the south of France where she started to make a name for herself. Then Paris where she starred at the Folie Bergère. Her rise was meteoric. In a few years she associated herself with William II, the Kaiser of Germany, King Edward VII, Russian Grand Dukes, the King of Spain. Most wealthy industrialists or bankers were thrilled to pass after such prestigious names and she built a fortune out of her activity. When she retired after the First World War, she had accumulated a fortune of $25 million, a huge amount at the time, in purchasing power parity that would make her almost a billionaire nowadays. Her later years were less successful. She maintained a lavish lifestyle for decades, but bit by bit 
she lost her fortune gambling and she died in relative poverty in 1965 in the south of France, aged 97. Her biggest rival was Liane de Pougy, another destiny worthy of a novel. Liane de Pougy was born in France, in the lower middle class. She escaped an unhappy marriage. One day her husband found her in bed with a lover, and he shot her with a revolver. And legend has it that the bullet hit her in a buttock. Nobody knows whether it actually happened or if it's a joke, but she would have asked her doctor whether the scar would remain visible, and the doctor would have answered, it will depend on you. In Paris, she starred as an actress slash courtesan, trained and helped by Valtes de la Bigne, another high-profile courtesan whose career was in decline because she was from the previous generation. Liane de Pougy also starred at the Folie Bergère, and she became Caroline Otero's main rival, even though the two exacerbated this rivalry. They played on it as a, a publicity stunt. She retired in 1910 after marrying a prince from Romania, so she uh, ended a princess. This was a long digression, but it gives you an idea of the world Mata Hari entered in the 1900s when she started to become famous as a dancer and as a courtesan. Mata Hari was never on a par with uh, these very high-profile stars of courtesanship, but still, she was relatively famous and attractive enough to collect wealthy lovers and live a very comfortable life. Just a few years after her rise to fame, many imitators had already appeared, and knowing that she was also a courtesan, critics started to turn harsher on her. She was not really respected as a dancer, in serious cultural institutions at least, and she was seen by them as a, a rather poor dancer, making up for it with exhibitionism. It didn't stop her from touring in Europe, but her career was already into decline in 1914, when the First World War started. Almost immediately, the frivolous mood in Paris vanished entirely and courtesans went into hiding or retired. The general tolerance or even sympathy for courtesans felt completely out of place when the country was at war and thousands of soldiers were dying every day just 200 miles east and north of Paris. Matahari left Paris and returned to the Netherlands via Spain and Britain to avoid the front line. The Netherlands stayed neutral during the First World War, so for a few years the country was a small enclave of peace, whereas all major European countries were at war. And at this point, Matahari no longer technically had a career and money started to lack again. In 1916, she was contacted by French agents who offered her to spy for France against a sizable amount of 1 million francs. That would be 3 million US dollars in today's dollars. They offered this because she had performed in front of the Kaiser's eldest son, the crown prince, the heir to the German crown before the war and they hoped she could seduce him and uh, obtain military secrets. Her nationality was an advantage, because the Netherlands were neutral. 
and in theory she could travel across frontiers. By the end of 1916, Mata Hari traveled to Madrid, Spain, and tried to arrange a meeting with the Crown Prince via a German diplomat. It is unclear whether she did it to obtain the meeting or out of greed, but apparently she offered to share French secrets with Germany, which would have meant becoming a double agent or betraying her French employers. It appears the Germans did not take her offer very seriously and they did something extremely shady. In order to get rid of her, they transmitted a radio message to Berlin from Madrid, mentioning an agent whose description closely matched her, so she was perfectly recognizable. And they used a code that they knew French intelligence had already broken, meaning that they were basically telling the French that Mata Hari was working for Germany. The truth is, Mata Hari was completely out of her league at this point. She was not a spy and was being used by French and German intelligence to test the other side. She was never able to provide any side with worthwhile information. She sold the Germans essentially gossips about French politicians and generals that were of no military interest. To test her, the French agents let her obtain the names of six Belgian spies. She was led to believe that five of them worked secretly for Germany and one was a double agent also working for France. Shortly after she received this information, the sixth agent was assassinated, tending to prove that Mata Hari had given this information to the Germans. When she came back from Spain to Paris, she was arrested immediately for treason, accused of spying for Germany, and imprisoned for interrogation. And then she was used for propaganda and political reasons. By the end of 1916 and beginning of 1917, the war looked like it would never end. France and Germany both had suffered more than a million casualties each on the Western Front in two years. But the front was desperately stable. Each side tried to retake the initiative in offensives and artillery attacks that ended in stalemate but they cost hundreds of thousands of lives. At the beginning of 1917, mutinies started to appear. The soldiers would sometimes refuse to launch assaults that would lead to their almost certain death for no result. And the French army repressed these mutinies with brutality, executing hundreds of soldiers to make an example Propaganda in every belligerent country had been intense since the start of the war and it was needed to keep the population and the army motivated to continue fighting. Unfortunately for Mata Hari, her naivety in accepting to enter the spying game and this particular context would be her undoing. French intelligence officers were not entirely convinced that she was a double agent, and during her interrogation she insisted that her loyalty went to France, her country of adoption. But she had the perfect profile of a scapegoat. She was a foreigner, she had international connections, she had had a frivolous life before the war and she had established contacts with the Germans. The fact that she was at most a low-level spy and never passed any valuable intelligence to either side could not save her. She was convicted of spying for Germany and executed in October 1917. 
looking at her story, which ultimately is rather sad, we see that she was more a victim herself rather than a victimizer. But given her profile and the circumstances, it didn't stop her name from becoming a synonym for dangerous femme fatale. That's a lot for someone who may have been naive and a bit greedy, maybe, but also tried to make the best out of the cards she had been dealt with her entire life. When she was executed, the war was still raging and remained indecisive on the front line. But the Allies were about to reverse the situation with a big push in 1918, helped by fresh troops from the USA that had just entered the war in April 1917. Mata did not die on a battlefront, but she was just another war casualty who lost control of her destiny. Our second story of the night is from the Second World War. And this time we're going to talk about a spy who did make a difference. He was German, but spied for the Soviet Union, and his name is Richard Zorge. Zorge was born in the Russian Empire in 1895 because his father was a mining engineer who worked on a contract for an oil company in Russia. His mother was Russian and the family returned to Germany, to Berlin, when he was three. And this is where he grew up, in Germany. His father had nationalist and imperialist views which was very common at the time for a bourgeois in Berlin. But their home was a bit different, with a Russian mother and uh, an ancestor, Friedrich Adolf Zorge, who had been an associate of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the founding fathers of the socialist doctrine. It didn't prevent Richard Zorge from sharing his father's nationalist views when he was young. And in 1914, when the First World War started, he enlisted in the German army. He served on the Western Front in France, where he was severely wounded in 1916, aged 21. He had started the war as a right-wing nationalist, but the experience of fighting dramatically changed his views. He became disillusioned and moved to the left. During his convalescence, he read Marx and he became a communist. As the war advanced, Communist ideas spread a lot in Germany as a result of the suffering imposed on the population and the realization that the nationalist dream of quickly winning a war and establishing Germany as the leading European power did not materialize. On the opposite, German soldiers died for very little result in the war against Russia France and Britain. On top of this, developments in Russia with the revolution, the fall of the Tsars and the emergence of the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, that took control of the revolution with the ambition to establish a brand new kind of society for the many and not for the few, had a huge impact on intellectuals and the working class in Germany. When the Emperor, the Kaiser, had to abdicate in 1918, as Germany was falling into chaos after years of blockade and the Allies now pushing forward on the Western Front, 
the communists in Germany were numerous, and some of them hoped that the communist revolution would spread to their country. It didn't, but Zorge was one of these educated German intellectuals who had joined the Communist Party. He had finished studying during the war and received a doctorate in political science, but could not find or keep a job because of his political views that got him fired. Without a job and seeing that revolutionary hopes in Germany were receding in 1919, he emigrated to the young Soviet Union, where he became a junior agent for the Comintern in Moscow. The Comintern, also known as the Communist International, was an international organization, in fact controlled by Moscow, that advocated the, the spread of communism in the world. He was quickly recruited as an agent for Soviet intelligence because he had the perfect profile. He was a sincere communist and he had chosen to emigrate to the Soviet Union even before the Bolsheviks had won the civil war after the revolution. He was an intellectual. He was fluent in his mother tongue, German. His mother was Russian. So he was sent to various European countries with the cover of a journalist to assess the possibility of communist revolutions in these countries. He gathered information in Germany from 1920 to 1924 returned to Moscow, and in 1929 he was sent to the United Kingdom for a short time to study the labor movement and the Communist Party of Great Britain. This is when he started to be undercover. He was instructed to stay out of politics in the UK, and later, the same year, he was sent to Germany where he joined the Nazi party and uh, took a journalist job with a newspaper. His stay in Germany was also short. He then went to China, to Shanghai, officially as the editor of a German news service, but in reality still working for Moscow. After China, he moved to Japan with the task of organizing an intelligence network there, still undercover as a German journalist. In the 1930s, there were big tensions between Japan and the USSR. Japan had just invaded Manchuria, north of China, and some Japanese generals wanted to push further and uh, attack the Soviet Union which was seen as weak and uh, unable to defend its most eastern territories. Before moving in Japan, Zorge had already managed to insinuate himself into the Nazi party years before this party seized power in Germany. In the party he was trusted as a sincerely Nazi journalist. He had read Hitler's writings and Nazi propaganda, and nobody could doubt his devotion to the cause inside the party, so that when Hitler seized power, he became a valuable asset for Moscow. His cover inside the Nazi party was so good that when he departed to Japan, Joseph Goebbels the future propaganda minister, attended his farewell dinner. When he settled in Japan in 1933, ten years of uh, efforts in building his cover as a German journalist paid off. He was the correspondent to the Frankfurter Zeitung, the most prestigious German newspaper at the time and this gave him a high profile 
as the most senior German journalist in Japan. He was instructed by Moscow to focus on the question of whether or not Japan was planning to attack the USSR. Zorge had no contact with the Japanese Communist Party, which was forbidden and remained underground. He could not contact the Soviet embassy for fear that his cover would be compromised. He was only in contact with a few other Soviet spies, some of them Japanese, others Europeans, working undercover in Tokyo. He successfully developed a network of agents in Japan, recruited in the Japanese population. These were people who had sympathies for the USSR and rejected the increasingly militarist dictatorship that the Japanese regime had turned into. Building progressively his network, Zorge could uh, infiltrate the administration with a very high-level contact, as high as the circle of the prime minister and uh, several senior politicians. He was also always welcome at the German embassy in Tokyo and it looked perfectly natural as the correspondent of a German newspaper that he seeked information there about Japanese politics. Establishing a spy in Japan was very difficult for any Western power. There was the language barrier the tendency of Japanese people to hide their real feelings and constantly remain perfectly polite, the relative closelessness of the country. But by becoming fluent in Japanese and entirely devoted to his mission, Zorge managed to overcome all these difficulties making him one of the Soviet intelligence most valuable assets in the world by the end of the 1930s. In 1936, Zorge correctly guessed that Japan was not going to attack the Soviet Union and instead invade China in 1937, information that he passed to Moscow. In the 1930s, Japan was increasingly imperialist and interested in projecting power in all of Asia. Since the country had begun to industrialize 70 years before, it had caught up some of its economic and scientific lag behind European countries and the USA. It had also expanded with colonies. There were Taiwan, Korea, islands in the Pacific taken from Germany after the First World War, Manchuria. Japan had defeated Russia in a war in 1905. It had taken a seat on the, the victor's side after the First World War. And its military, in particular, was keen to keep expanding. Overall, there was a sense of superiority and a belief that Japan's destiny was to dominate Asia, well rooted in the population. At some point, it seemed unavoidable that this expansionism would clash with one or several of its neighbors, Europeans with their colonies, the USA in the Pacific or the Soviet Union. Relations between Germany and Japan were not particularly cordial at the beginning of the 1930s. In fact, Germany even sent military instructors to China. Their relations improved from 1936, when they signed the Anti-Comintern Pact, which was a, a loose agreement, not an alliance yet targeted at the Soviet Union. By the end of the 1930s, 
Zorge was so blindly trusted at the German embassy and uh, he knew so well the intricacies of Japanese politics that he had become the primary source of most of the information that the Germans in Japan sent to Berlin. Ironically for Zorge, being a communist spy in Tokyo, living undercover, was probably much safer by then than living in Moscow. By the 1930s, and with the arrival of Stalin at the head of the USSR, the Soviet regime became increasingly dictatorial and paranoid. Stalin ordered massive purges of civil servants, officers, journalists, members of the Communist Party, even scientists or artists, and internally the USSR lived years of terror when a single word or a denunciation could send you and your family at best to the gulag, at worst to torture and death. Most officers who had been in power in the 1920s, politicians and high-level civil servants, did not survive this period. With his experience as a spy that had started in the 1920s under Lenin and his German nationality, Zorge would have been at a very high risk of being arrested in Moscow, however precious he was as an asset. So he was cautious enough to not set foot back in the USSR, including in 1937 when he received an order from Stalin to come back. He ignored it and found a pretext to stay in Japan. It is hard to know to what extent he was aware of what was going on in the Soviet Union. The same question actually applies to many heads of communist parties around the world. The information that filtered out of the USSR was confusing and it was hard to know for the general population whether the USSR had turned into a dystopia or whether it was smeared in the press, which was generally hostile to communism indeed. But a number of diplomats, spies or local heads of communist parties remained loyal even though they knew about what was going on. Either they chose to ignore it, or they believed it was a necessary evil to eliminate counter-revolutionaries. This is how the purges and internal repression were presented by the Stalinist regime. Or maybe they were being cynical. But the thing is, few communists lost faith in the USSR in the 1930s. But it took much longer until the 1950s, for many sincere communists to open their eyes about the reality of the USSR. Anyway, even though Zorge knew about many crimes happening in the Soviet Union, communism and serving the USSR was his life, and he never betrayed nor expressed any doubt about it. Zorge was already useful before the Second World War, and he became crucial when the war began. In 1939, war was declared in Europe when Germany attacked Poland, and its allies, the UK and France, had no other option than declare war on Germany. 1940 was the year of disaster for France, which was overwhelmed in a few weeks, and only Britain stayed in the war, resisting to the German aviation and the deployment of submarines in the Atlantic. Just before attacking, Germany had signed a pact with the Soviet Union that was supposed to guarantee peace between them, at least for a while, and uh, that also organized the sharing of Poland between them 
as well as a trade agreement. Both sides had no doubt that they would be at war at some point. Hitler hoped he could make peace in the West first, before turning against the USSR. And Stalin needed more time to reorganize the Red Army, which had lost many experienced officers after the purges, and needed to modernize a lot of its equipment. For the USSR, knowing when Germany could attack and whether Japan would also participate in the war became even more important. Zorge correctly informed Moscow in 1941 that Germany was preparing an attack in June. Stalin received several similar warnings, but he ignored them because he could not believe it would happen so soon and also because there had been false alarms before. But it happened, and on June the 22nd, 1941, Germany launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. The first few months of the invasion were a success for Germany, with German armies advancing even faster than in France and making millions of prisoners while destroying or capturing an incredible quantity of equipment. But the difference with France was that Russia had way more space and population, and despite the complete route of the Red Army at the beginning, Moscow was far away from the front line and uh, couldn't fall quickly like Paris had. Faced with the German invasion, the Soviet Union still had to maintain precious divisions in the Far East in case Japan would join the war. But Japan had problems of its own. The invasion of China had started in 1937, but despite gains and uh, control of many coastal regions, China was just too big and populated to fall entirely. The Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang, the party that controlled the rest of China, had stopped fighting and had allied against the Japanese invader. Japan was also preparing its invasion of Asia and the Pacific meaning that there was little interest in starting yet another front against the Soviet Union. Zorge kept Moscow informed of all this, and once again was proved right. Japan never started war against the USSR in 1941, because it had other priorities, and after, because it no longer had the means to do it. In September 1941, when the Red Army kept losing ground and abandoning its equipment, it appeared possible that the Germans would capture Moscow before the end of the year. This was important to them because the arrival of the winter, which would be very harsh in Russia, would make operations much more complicated. At the same time, a secret imperial conference in Japan decided against the war with the Soviet Union and uh, to attack the USA and Britain instead to expand in Southeast Asia and uh, the Pacific. Zorge could inform Moscow of this. Together with other sources, he allowed for the Red Army to redeploy troops in the West for the defense of Moscow, and even though he was not the only source, his contribution to the Battle of Moscow cannot be underestimated. This Battle of Moscow in the winter of 1941-1942 is maybe the single most important battle in the Second World War because of its size and strategic importance 
there were plenty of other important battles, but this one was bigger and its outcome could have decided the fate of the war between Germany and the USSR. After months of progress in Russia, Moscow was now in sight for the German army, and it was a major target. It was a big industrial center. It was symbolic as the largest city in the USSR and its capital, of course, and Stalin could no longer accept to back down after months of defeats and the loss of various other big cities like Kiev or Minsk. St. Petersburg, Leningrad, the second Russian city, was being circled at the same time, and Moscow could not fall without compromising the capacity of the Soviet Union to counterattack, militarily and psychologically too. The Germans had started to slow down before reaching Moscow, because their troops ran thinner with the losses, and the fact that the front line was constantly becoming longer as they advanced. Also, the winter started early in 1941 and proved particularly cold, which put all belligerents to hell during the battle. Finding just a hole or the ruins of a house to light a fire became a matter of survival for German soldiers every night. Fuel freezed inside the vehicles. The supply lines were so extended that they lacked food and ammunition, and they had not received winter equipment to resist the cold. The Red Army, under a general that would later become even more famous, Zhukov, organized the defense of Moscow, and this defense was completed with fresh troops from Siberia that could be brought back to the west, to western Russia, thanks to the absence of Japanese attack. These troops were instrumental in the defense of Moscow and uh, the Soviet victory in this battle. The Germans reached the suburbs of Moscow and could even see the towers of the Kremlin in the horizon. But at this point, their army was so exhausted that it could no longer advance and German casualties rose vertiginously. After weeks of fighting, the Red Army showed an extraordinary resilience and capacity to counter-attack. A counter-offensive was launched around Moscow and in other parts of the front line, forcing the Germans to retreat on dozens and sometimes hundreds of miles at a huge human cost for the Soviets. When the situation stabilized for the rest of the winter, Moscow had been saved, and the USSR was rediscovering hope that it could maybe triumph in this war. And it ultimately did, after three more years of fighting and uh, millions of dead. The same year, in 1941, Zorba's position in Tokyo was becoming more and more risky. His radio messages could never be deciphered by the Japanese, but denoted the radio emissions. The Germans also grew more suspicious for a while, and the embassy in Tokyo was instructed to monitor Zorke more closely. In October 1941, Zorke sent his last message to Moscow, asking to be reaffected to Germany from where he would be able to help by uh, providing intelligence about the German war effort. But the Japanese had arrested a man from his network, and he quickly confessed, giving them Zorge's name. Zorge was arrested shortly after, on suspicions of espionage, 
Initially, the Japanese thought he was an agent of German intelligence, the Abwehr. But the Abwehr denied, and uh, under torture, Zorge confessed that he was a Soviet agent. The Soviet Union always denied he was an agent, and uh, refused to trade him for a Japanese spy, basically dropping him now that his cover was lost. In uh, November 1944, after three years in jail, and uh, at a time when it had become obvious that Germany and Japan were going to lose the war, Zorge was hanged. He had had a Japanese lover for several years, a woman called Hanako Hishi. After the war, in 1949, she located and recovered his skeleton. She had him cremated and uh, had a tombstone erected for him, stating in Japanese, Here lies a hero who sacrificed his life fighting against war and for world peace. It may be a, a bit of a stretch for a Soviet spy who worked for Stalin, but still, he was indeniably brave and died for his ideals. Hanako Ishii died in 2000, aged 89. The Soviet Union did not acknowledge him until 1964, almost 20 years after the end of the war. Maybe, despite his contribution to the survival of the Soviet Union in 1941, he could not be acknowledged under Stalin, because the fact that Stalin rejected Zorge's warning about the attack in 1941 could not be known. We have now reached the end of our journey through history. I hope you found these two stories interesting. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Sleep well, and I'll talk to you soon for a new adventure. Au revoir.